I used to be the guy that uh, used to say URL, ubiquity now, revenue later. I don't say that anymore. That's that's for a young guy. Um, and so there are some businesses like freemium where that really matters, where you need a massive amount of users. And then you need so many of these folks. Um, I, I don't think that way anymore. I think product market fit and really understand your economics is, will your customer pay for something? It doesn't even have to be a lot of money. And do they come back and engage with you? My name is Kevin David, and if you want real financial freedom for yourselves and for your loved ones today, then the time is now. And I will be there to help you every step of the way. What is up, guys? And welcome back to another exciting episode of your favorite podcast, The Kevin David Experience, or soon to be favorite podcast. I promise, give us a shot and we'll prove it to you. Uh, today, we have a very special guest. But as always, a quick shout out to you guys who've been leaving us reviews on iTunes, and an even bigger shout out for people who are sharing the podcast with one friend, one family member, 1% of people share the podcast, but you 1% mean the most to me. So we wanted to give a big thank you. So today we have a special guest, Matt Hewlett, um, who's joining us from uh, Seattle. Hopefully it's not raining there there today, Matt. Um, the first question that we ask everybody on the podcast is to summarize your entrepreneurial journey all the way up until right now in 60 seconds or less. Got it. Uh, I can think I can do that. So I've been in tech, entrepreneurial tech for 30 years. I've uh, been a public company president three times, startup CEO twice, and uh, with companies you've heard of like Real Networks, Expedia, and Rosetta Stone, and a lot of companies you've never heard of. I've raised yeah. money from Draper Fisher Jerviston, uh, Allen & Company, Sequoia Capital, and I've, I've done everything in tech. So I love that. <laughs> did, you, did you study tech or did you like, or, or did you just love it? Like, what did, did you go to college? How, how, did, how did you get into tech originally? Yeah, so I was a little late bloomer to tech, but I, you know, I started coding on my Commodore 64. What uh, that dates me? I'm 50. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was like kind of early, and then I didn't do much, and then later in life, I became like a product manager intern at a software company, and I got involved in tech. Yeah. You know, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, through that. Right. So what what did you do specifically at Expedia? Because I. The, right now, or, or you know, I was I was reading about you earlier. Um, you're you're at Rosetta Stone, is that correct? That's right. Right, but but you so you were the president at Expedia, or what was your what was your role there, and what did that actually like look like? Yeah, I I went to Expedia right as I um, basically hunkered down and bunkered down in a Web 1L blow up company called Adam Shockwave, which was a company I started with a guy named Mika Salmi who's the coolest guy I'll never be, discovered all these big bands and stuff. And like literally like Sequoia Capital put this money in, the Web 1.0 burst happened, there was no venture capital to be had. We had like 25 million and we put it in a box and they lived through the bubble. And then I was up in Seattle licking my wounds and the CEO of Expedia, Rich Barton at the time, called me up and got me to go to Expedia. So I was like employee one of this uh, business unit that I started that did corporate travel. So selling corporate uh, travel solutions to corporations. And so I was a president of that division when I was way too young. I wouldn't have given myself that job at that age. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did he like find you or, or hear about you at the time, the CEO? Yeah, Rich uh, was on the board of that company, Adam Shockwave. And at the time he was the CEO of Expedia and he's gone on to be the CEO and founder of Zillow and Glassdoor and a bunch of other companies. Damn. So, so he really knows what's up. What, what was the guy you were saying that the coolest guy, who are you talking about the, that found bands or what was that? Yeah. Yeah. So the guy that started the Adam shock was a guy named Mika Salmi and we met each other at a company called real networks, which was like a high flying company back in the web one Oh days invented streaming. And he was kind of an A&R rep for music companies. So he discovered the nine inch nails and the presence of the United States of America and a lot of bands. And so he was he was the CEO and I was the president of that company. Mm. So he like went on to like do like music as like an agent or something like that? No, after that, we eventually sold that company and I was long gone, but he stayed on and sold it to Viacom. Um, oh. The MTV group bought that that business and he went on to stay in media. Yeah. What What's your opinion on like, like, because there's kind of two schools of thought to this, right? Um, you know, there's like the don't take a huge risk, find a company that already has product market fit and then like go niche or like create some meaningful iteration to it. Like how Bumble did to Tinder, right? Like Bumble wasn't a new idea. They didn't have to risk a bunch of capital for product market fit, right? Whitney knew that, that Tinder already had that, but she knew also that there was like that 20% 
meaningful iteration that that really changed like the nature of the app enough to become something you know big and valuable and beautiful that's kind of like option one versus something like you know and this is an extreme example but like versus something like spacex right or like Neuralink, like where it's like a totally brand new idea no one's ever done it for the most part before like what's your opinion having kind of founded your own companies, been a part of other companies of trying to be truly innovative as like a, a beginning or seasoned entrepreneur versus like doing something that works, but like changing it enough to be like different and, and potentially successful. That is one of the world's best questions and it's the <laughs> hardest one to answer. So yeah. uh, I'm actually writing a book on this subject and you're talking about timing as well. I think timing is the biggest element of that. And I, I tell you this is um, two things. It, in general, you're going to want to have a strategy that whatever it is, based on those two options, it's small and growing fast. So it could be a niche growing fast, or it could, some, it could be something in terms of an addressable market that's going to be very large and growing fast. But if you're an entrepreneur, whether you decide to bootstrap yourself or get outside venture capital, small and growing fast is way better than the laggard company trying to reinvent it. And that's what I've done in some companies. Um, to answer your question, I think it's easier to actually take something that's existing or an idea from the past, dust it off and do it again. Like look at Zoom versus WebEx. You know, that's a great example. Like you mentioned the Bumble example. There's tons of versions of that where it was really cool maybe 10 years ago and someone took another view at it because the form factor was different and they did something unique to it. And I think that's a lot easier. Look at Stripe, you know, two lines of code and you get access to payments, you know. It's, it's, you know, versus Braintree, you know, Braintree could have done that. So yeah. I, I would say that's easier, but in general, I would tell anyone that's looking at doing them themselves, bootstrap or venture, look at for something small in terms of small market, but growing really, really fast because eventually you're going to be able to ride up against an incumbent. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and like, so I'll give you a little context and then I'll ask my next question. So there, there's a company called um, Rocket Internet based in Germany. Have, have you ever heard of them? Mm -hmm. So like the three, I think they're the Samware brothers. Basically what they do is like they, they emulate successful companies in the U.S. in Silicon Valley and then take them over like into European like countries and things like that. They did that with, with Airbnb. I forget the company, but Airbnb at the time had like 40, 50 employees. And like within months, they had this like clone of Airbnb that had 400 employees that had like hundreds of millions of dollars of, of market cap. And, and I remember Brian Chesky uh, in an interview saying that he asked Mark Zuckerberg, like, what should we do? Because the ultimate choice was, do they sell 25% of Airbnb to kind of absorb this company that the Samware brothers had just made? Or do they try to compete against like a much more heavily funded and larger, you know, more kind of structured potentially company? And Mark Zuckerberg's answer was, don't sell the best product will win. Do you agree that that like the best product will win, or can companies with you know heavier capitalization just like out muscle um, uh, companies, or, or which would you say more happens more frequently? Mm, that's a great question. So real quick, the copycat thing works famously well. I mean, China Chinese entrepreneurs for years would take you know existing template from the United States, do it within China, uh, in a very protected environment behind the Great Wall. And, yeah. and copycat everything. Um, so that that's worked. In gaming, I did mobile gaming and social gaming for a while. There was companies in Europe that just saw what was going in the United States, like Wooga and King. King was Candy Crush. They just looked at what hap was happening in the United States and said, okay, screw it. They're not really focused on Europe or anywhere else. We'll just do that thing there. That works famously well. And that's kind of the example of the existing thing, but grow it faster. That That's not really answering your question. I would say that... It depends on where that market is in terms of formation. Like a later stage market, you can really deploy capital and kill innovation. Like look at Tencent in gaming. Like if yeah. you're trying to spend any money in customer acquisition, they're just going to just shove as much capital as they can to make it very expensive to acquire customers. When I was at Expedia, we did the same thing. Like we had this one innovation around really selling hotels at a high margin, and then we just slammed on the customer acquisition costs and made it so hard for anyone to buy paid marketing uh, acquisition they couldn't get in. So you see that in later in the market and you see companies starting to buy other companies like IAC buys a lot of different companies like in the dating space. You see, you know, Alphabet getting larger and larger and larger and getting different verticals. 
Yeah, but I would say you see that in later stage. In early stage, as the market's developing, you don't typically see that. Right. Yeah. And what what is your opinion on like breaking even or or like even profitability? Because I was talking to a, a buddy who you know has been very successful, and he was saying that being profitable as like a startup, you know, at the beginning or even in like the beginning middle stages, is actually hurts your valuation because you know VCs and, and people will come in and you know if you don't need the money then they're not gonna give you money right and so you know what's your opinion on kind of churning like a bunch of because I see all these companies all the time like they lost 300 million dollars and they're worth like 10 billion right yeah. per year so like what's in my in my life so far all the businesses that I've ever made have been like net profitable from day one or like close to it but I think ultimately that's the wrong mentality to have if you want to create something truly big. And so is there like, a, and there's companies like Zapier, for example, who've, who've done both, like they're worth $5 billion. They were profitable from the basically very beginning. And so, you know, is that a unicorn or, or which, which, or do you understand both options or what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it, it depends on what game. And you've asked this, I've listened to a bunch of your other episodes and you brought people on that I know like Chip Conley, Airbnb. There's actually some old customers of mine, like Wesley Virgin, I was the CEO of ClickBank. Oh, nice. I've seen, I've seen every version of this. It depends on what game you're playing. If you're playing the um, big horizontal market strategy, like you're going after a billion dollar plus addressable market, then you're going to need growth capital and you're going to need to burn a lot of cash. And it's all about discounted cash flows. If you see a big opportunity in the future and it's about speed getting there, by definition, you're going to have to raise venture capital and cash flow is less important. But if you're building like an Amazon, I have a lot of friends who build like um, Amazon businesses. Sound familiar, Kevin? And they build a lot of Amazon businesses that are cash flow positive and they're making a ton of bank. There's nothing wrong with those businesses. Those, are, those aren't venture scale businesses by and large. So it just depends on how big the opportunity is. Yeah. And, and I mean, you see examples like, I mean, obviously this is an absurd example, but like Mark, Zuck like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Jeff Bezos, they own like 10 ish percent of their companies right but their companies are so freaking gigantic that 10 percent is worth hundreds of billions of dollars right versus people like what do you think about entrepreneurs that have the mentality of like never giving away any equity but because they never give away any equity they probably are or definitely cost themselves from getting the best people that would otherwise allow their company to grow larger yeah again it's just about how big you think the business can be like to me, it's like I have a lot of my, my programmer friends are like, hey, I don't understand this business thing. Discounted cash flows. I don't understand that. I'm like, do you have five seconds? I can show you how to do it in Excel. And it's yeah. just it, it's that, you know, how much are the cash outflows and the inflows? And if those cash inflows are massive and you believe that in the future and once you take venture, you're addicted to the crack cocaine. Like you have <laughs> to keep taking venture capital. So once you go down the venture capital route, you have to raise as much money as you possibly can. And you have to grow really fast because each venture capitalist is expecting a 10x return on that investment. So you're already down a path. So once you take venture, you're down a path. MailChimp, for instance, they didn't take capital for a long, long time. And that's probably the exception to the rule. So I would yeah. say, look, if you're building a business that has kind of a small addressable market under a billion dollars, I would build a really good cash flow business. You don't, you don't need capital. If you can bootstrap it yourself, you don't need capital. And that's fine. Um, yeah. If you go down the venture route, you know, it's a crapshoot. Most of those businesses don't generate the billions of dollars that you're talking about. Do you think that like, and maybe this is an obvious question, but do you think taking venture like increases your stress levels like almost 100% of the time, like adding that extra pressure? Or do you think for certain entrepreneurs that pressure is, is like a good thing because it makes them work harder than they would otherwise? Like, I guess my question is, I've thought about doing venture, right? But like, I don't want a boss. You know what I mean? Like, I, and I don't want like, I don't want somebody who's like making decisions for me, I guess. Well, once you under, un, once you own under 50%, then you have a, a, a boss effectively. Right. They can, they can replace you. So, you know, what I know in terms of, if you go down the venture route, let's say you have a great idea and it's, it's an addressable market where, you know, either you're going to have to like, find massive debt yourself it's beyond your means right that that's when it's going to push you then then you have a, a question to ask yourself is if, what rate can i invest money and what's the ownership going to be in terms of dilution if you're doing really well and you can raise money at a high valuation 
you don't have to give away a lot of your company. So it really depends. I would say most people that are, that are going after something really big and kind of squander the opportunity. And I know I have a couple of friends have done that. They, yeah. they, they don't want to give an, away enough and they don't grow fast enough to take advantage of the opportunity. So many right. of these play, if you listen to Reed Hoffman and read his books on blitz scaling, it's really about going after those opportunities as fast as you possibly can, because a lot of these businesses have fast mover advantage and you have to move incredibly fast. And the alternative is IPO and or get acquired. And so those are big stakes. So if you want to play that, you push your chips in the middle, you take some dilution and you just go for it and you get the best team possible. If it's a smaller opportunity, build a nice cash flow business. There's nothing wrong generating million, two million dollars worth of cash. Yeah. And so like in your opinion, like what's, you know, and this is a, this is a difficult question, but like what's the optimal way to do it? Cause like, in my opinion, right. You know, and you, you know, you can like split the shares into like a and B class and have the B class have like, you know, 20 times as many voting rights and like retain your ownership and not be able to like be ousted by the board, which I think is kind of a prerequisite in my opinion, at least like, what's the optimal way of doing it, it like for, for you. And then, you know, for, for people in general. Right. And I know it depends on whether they want to grow some massive billion dollar company or they want like a lifestyle business where they're happier and have less stress, but like, what, what is it according to you? It all comes down to it's, it's as simple as, and, and is this, and it's hard as this is raise as much money as you possibly can when it's advantageous to you. And, and yeah. generally what that means is, you're raising money when you have, you know, people talk about product market fit. Mark Andreessen has the best quote for it. Like if you want to just Google, it's like, you know, maybe two paragraphs of bliss. You know, it's like, you know, money's coming from the heaven and everything's easy. But it's you want to raise money when you actually have a business that's growing. You have the unit economics figured out. You understand your lifetime value, your customer acquisition costs, and that you have multiple people wanting to invest in your business. At that point, you can say, look, my valuation is X. I want to be diluted only to Y. And here are the terms of that investment. That's the best place to be. Um, now, this this era of SPACs and the 70% of IPOs are SPACs and, you know, we're in growth zone. This is probably one of those times where I'd start accumulating a lot of venture capital if I was running a company right now. I can kind of feel my spidey sense and some other folks are kind of feeling like uh, inflation's coming in maybe tough times ahead long term. So I'd be I'd be accumulating capital right now if I had a really good idea. Yeah. And so for people who are listening, right, who, who may have a business, when you say things like, you know, unit economics, LTV, um, like what what are the what's like a way that you could explain that to a five year old? So so everybody listening kind of understands what you mean by that. Yeah, like like lifetime value of the customer is the total amount that you extract from a customer, the total value you extract from a customer. So, for example, I sell Rosetta Stone a lifetime product for $199. And $199 for that customer I'm acquiring is paying me $199 for the life of that customer uh, engagement. Um, and I pay about half of that in acquiring those customers. And that's from Google and Facebook. So it's the lifetime value divided by the customer acquisition costs. And you want that ratio as high as possible. Right. And and that's as simple as it gets. And what what basically is it's, how does the business work? Because most knowledge-based technology businesses, you want high gross margin. So there's not a lot of cost of this business. And so understanding your customer acquisition costs and understanding the lifetime value of a customer is really important. Everything else you can figure out, like programmers, accountants, lawyers, when you need them eventually, you can figure all that out. But if you don't figure out the unit economics, how it works, you're going to be in trouble. So I always encourage people to really understand how do you get customers? How much do they pay you? And how much does it cost? Yeah. And we, so like, can you give some examples that the audience might understand of like unit economics with like, I don't know, Airbnb or Uber or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, back in the day um, at Expedia, I'll just, this is years ago, I was at Expedia. Um, we made money off airlines, hotels, cars, and other stuff. We actually would sell like Las Vegas vacations at one point and all in, I'm just going to make this up. We made about like $35 per transaction and we made about, we spent about, I don't know, 10 to $15 to acquire all those customers. And so that's an example. We, as we sold more hotels, that value went from $35 to like $50, something like that. And the customer acquisition costs stayed the same. So our gross margin, the Delta between the revenue and the costs went way up. 
that's an example yeah. of, of your customer. Right. And when you can, I mean, cause like something that I hear from, you know, other co-founders is, you know, LTV is a, is a great idea, but when your company is only six months old, you don't know what your LTV is, right? Cause you haven't been around long enough necessarily to know. So what do you do in that case? Yeah, I'm a big believer in, um, when I hear folks say that, I'm a big believer in two things. Cause I, I used to be the guy that uh, used to say URL, ubiquity now, revenue later. I don't say that anymore. That's that's for a young guy. Um, and so there are some businesses like freemium where that really matters, where you need a massive amount of users. And then you need so many of these folks. And then like, you you know, you mentioned the beginning of the show, the 1%. It's about 1% to 2% of those people buy something like Duolingo. That's yeah. about the ratio that you get there. Um, I, I don't think that way anymore. I think product market fit and really understand your economics is, will your customer pay for something? It doesn't even have to be a lot of money. And do they come back and engage with it? Those two things I always look at. And so I understand what people say when it's too hard to figure that out. But if you're not thinking about monetization when you start a business, it's so hard to do it later. Right. Yeah. And so like you brought up Duolingo and I was going to bring this up also. Right. So I don't know what the valuation of Duolingo and Rosetta Stone are off the top of my head, unfortunately. But, you know, Duolingo is the freemium model. And for people listening who don't know what that means. It means that it's free to get in and you can use like a material amount of the service for free, but then some like really juicy features that they've kind of figured out that, that you know, the majority of power users or people might want to increase, you know, or expand their experience, they make you pay for. And I pay for Duolingo personally, like I, you know, I learned Spanish with it. Um, you know, I, I enjoy using it and I think it has a really beautiful design. And so what, what is your opinion on, on freemium model? Do you, do you think it's always better to do what you just mentioned, where you find product market fit, where people are willing to pay? Or in certain cases, does the freemium model make sense? I, I think it depends. I think there's, there's really only two strategies in business. This is, this is, I think, for any business. Either you're low cost or free or you're premium. And that's not just me. That's a guy named Michael Porter wrote this book on competitive advantage. And he has this two by two graph. And, it, and for everything in life, you can you, in terms of strategy, is low cost free or premium. Anything in the middle, you're dead. You're absolutely dead. And so, for example, like Apple is premium. There's like tons of phones out there that are using Android, but they are the most expensive all the time. They're going after a premium experience. I mean, yeah. If you want a Xiaomi phone in China, that's really, really cheap. It just looks like Apple, but it's not the same type of product experience. Um, you know, it's kind of like um, Tinder versus eHarmony. You know, there's a premium experience. I want to get married or I want to do other stuff, you know, uh, have more casual relationships. And I think that th that's really the answer for you is they can both coexist. I see a lot of venture based businesses go freemium first because they need to raise a lot of product to, to do what's called product market led growth. So they have a really awesome product. People love it. They want to talk about it and it just grows massively. I see a lot of venture-based businesses doing that first. Um, and the premium strategy works as well, but they can right. coexist. One's not better than the other. Right. And so what, kind of a, a, a non sequitur here, but I'm just interested. What, what is your mentality about, about investing, right? Because, I mean, there, there comes to a certain point in any successful person's career where they have more money than they're, they need to, like, live. Right. So are you a big investor? Do you do stocks? Do you do real estate? Do you do uh, angel investing? Do you do none of it? What what's your mentality about it personally? And, and what advice could you give, you know, people who, who might be, you know, 18, 22 years old? Yeah. So I, I just just in full disclosure, I have three kids, 21, 17 and 11. So some of this nice. advice I've given them and, and hopefully they're listening at some point. Um, <laughs> Start as young as you possibly can investing and go as aggressive as you can in the stocks. Nearly all of your investments should be in stocks. You should, you should not really diversify your investments. I think diversification is ridiculous because you're basically taking a dollar's worth of value and deciding to diversify across a number of different investments. I just, I don't believe in that. I believe in very, very focused investments on things that you understand and that you study. Um, so I typically like liquid investments. I like things that are more aggressive. I like things, personally, I like FinTech and e-commerce and banking and stuff like that. So I invest a lot in there um, and I like liquidity. And so for a young person, I would just start understanding the basics of creating value, go into stocks, not bonds, and look to have a, a targeted group of, 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 of investments versus a lot of different investments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Warren, I just finished one of Warren Buffett's books 
he was saying that diversification doesn't make any sense because why would you put the same amount of your money into your second favorite, third favorite, and fourth favorite investments versus 100% of it into your first, right? right. Which, which, and Mark, Mark Cuban says the same thing. Diversification is for idiots. He puts it a little bit, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, when you hear these like a top top caliber people like yourself, Warren Buffett, all these people, right, saying the same thing, when you know society and kind of like the mainstream, you know, learning or whatever you want to call it, kind of like you know harps on diversification, it's interesting to kind of hear hear that dynamic. And so the last question that that I'll ask you, Matt, and this is a question we we ask everyone. So if you've heard the podcast, you probably know what I'm about to ask. If you could go back and talk to 18 year old Matt, what would you tell him? Have some friggin' patience. And, and this goes to your investing idea, Kevin, is if if I, I all my friends invest behind me. And because I'm like so eager to do the next thing, I jump around and fix businesses for a living. If I would just would have said, be more patient. And I would just tell all your listeners, look, if you're an entrepreneur and you're younger, invest early, take measured risks, and be friggin' patient because human beings are really horrible at long-term planning like revolution evolutionary wise we're really good at figuring out if a bear is going to kill us and we kind of figure that out but like we we don't do well thinking a year down the road i mean heck the united states is freaked out about the coronavirus still and everyone's getting vaccines in 30 days and people are going cuckoo for cocoa puffs i mean we can't think beyond 30 days here so i would just say look to every, for me to be patient i'd ask all your listeners to be patient and be very focused on what you want to do and what you're good at and be and be patient on that. Don't worry about the things that you're not good at. You can hire people to do that. Be patient right. and focus on the thing that you're good at. OK, I actually lied because I do have one more question. OK, um, so for for you, right, because I mean, you've done both, but I'm just curious to your perspective on it. Right. What are the pros and cons to like you specifically to like run a pre-existing company, right? As like the president or whatever versus like starting your own startup. Do you think that it has to do with the point in your life you're at or just the mentality of the entrepreneur or, or what would you say like the, the number one pro and con of, of each strategy, whether it's creating your own startup, your own versus joining an existing one? Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, that's a really good question. So I hate, I hope, to not be so controversial. And I don't know where my Canadian accent came from. I'm not Canadian. <laughs> it's kind of the difference between dating and marriage. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is when you're, when you're joining an existing company, you have the, the comfort of knowing usually there's cash, there's a strategy, something's working. And, and it's not more, it's not really about the calamity that's going to come around the corner. Right. And so it does feel a little bit more like, you know, a marriage secure secure startups you know you don't know what's going to happen and it's exciting but it's also scary i've had instances where i run out i've almost run out of money 30 days before payroll and you're like i don't know what i'm going to do and it's all on you to raise the money so i i, I don't know what's more exciting every other job i do big company than i do startup every time every time and i love both but that's that's what it feels like if you're young I would go and work for a branded company and then get your ass kicked at a startup. <laughs> but like, if you, it's so important in your career, sorry to go over a little bit, but to say, hey, I worked at insert big company name here and I started my own thing. I hire people like that because they've had a good mentor. They can talk to it. And I'm like, oh, they worked at Google. They worked at Facebook. They worked at Amazon. Oh, and then they actually decided to get their butt kicked and started a business. Right. Those people I always hire. Right. Yeah. I love it. So if people want to reach out to, to you, if you do that, or they want to learn more about, you know, what you're doing with Rosetta Stone, what's like the best way to, to contact you or learn more? Yeah. So I have a website, startupwhisper.com, or you can just uh, DM me on Twitter, Matt underscore Hewlett. I love it. Thank you for coming on so much, brother. Like you're, you're such an interesting guy. I love the energy. I can feel it through the computer. So I'm sure we'll, we'll meet again someday. Absolutely. Loved it, Kevin. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother.